Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Jill and uh, I'm one of the Dharma teachers with True North Insight and happy to share some reflections and practice with you tonight or today whenever you're watching with us, practicing with us. The talk tonight is inspired by um, an author and well, she's written over 20 books, <laughs> a prolific author, um, historian, feminist, social change, activist, um, are some of her titles, Rebecca Solnit, S-O-L-N-I-T, and um, an article I recently read uh, called Hope is an Embrace of the Unknown, written by her. She wrote a book about hope many years ago, uh, 2003, um, called Hope in the Dark. And um, this article was written like eight years after that. Uh, but I love uh, how she talks about hope in a time when there's so much despair and reframes hope from our cultural well, it could come from many sources. Sometimes our idea of of what what hope is and how she reframes that with lots of other wise people that feel the same way. Uh, so I guess I'll start with what she says hope is not. Hope is... Um, not the belief that everything was or will be fine. <laughs> and we might be like, what? I thought that's exactly what hope was, that everything will be fine. Um, and actually, that's spiritual bypassing, that hope is uh, this type of hope. It's called wise hope and or, um, ordinary hope, or I would say diluted hope might be that kind of hope like everything will be fine you know so and some people that's their that's their fuel <laughs> they really run on that boy it's exhausting to be around and I can't imagine how exhausting it is to live that way to constantly be telling yourself um, everything will be fine everything will be fine how could you possibly um that takes a lot of denial when we can see all around us, everything is not fine. That there is great, um, of course, climate disaster, human, humanity crisis and suffering and um, inequality and abuse. And so hope, wise hope, doesn't mean denying any of these realities. It also doesn't need to mean denying our own realities of aging, of sickness, of loss, grief. Um, and, and living on false hope uh, is, um, I've been around some people lately that have been operating that way and Boy, it takes a toll. It's super exhausting. So wise hope in this context and in the understanding of the Dharma is um, facing and addressing the realities in a wider context of remembering what else has happened and what else is possible that we can get into so it's we we can also slide into the opposite of kind of diluted hope is pessimism that you know there's no point it's all going to crap we're you know that um just despair and um really makes us give up we how can we uh, engage with the world and with our own actions and wisdom if we're 
fully enveloped by pessimism and despair that creates inaction which is um counter to wisdom so so hope is not the belief that everything will be fine um Re rebecca says that hope is a gift that you don't have to surrender and hope is a power that you don't have to throw away it was interesting to reflect on hope being a power. Yeah. So uh, on uh, Rebecca, one of the, her, her latest book, is, I think is called Not Too Late. And there's a kind of a hashtag movement um, and uh, a new website called Not Too Late. I'll put the link for it down below as well as Rebecca's site with her books um and on that page she's quoted um his name's Vaclav Havel he's a Czechoslovakian dissident and politician playwright author um who said this about hope hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. I love that. So if we have a conviction that something will turn out well, that's that's like, you know, everything will be fine. It's, it's uh, not based on reality because we know there's infinite variables so much out of our control and that change is the absolute constant. Um, and so to have a conviction that something will turn out well is it's not based on uh, reality. Rather, hope is the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. That's beautiful. And this uh, really reminded me of our ethics, our sila, morality, our values. In our uh, these Dharma teachings, there's five basic ethics that lay people, householders, um, endeavor to uphold and cultivate. And this really is to me, resonant with that phrase, it, it's something worth doing no matter how it turns out. We let go of the attachment to the outcome. We don't know how it will, what will result, but we know it's the right thing to do. We know it's what frees our own hearts and minds. We know it's what creates kindness, safety. We know that these values, these trainings um, provide safety for others as well. They know they're safe with us when we are really living by these ethics. If you're not familiar with them, I'll list them down below in the recording. And um, in brief, I, I think there's probably talks on this channel some time back, I might need to revisit these on each of these ethics. Um, so I won't go into them in a, a very full way right now. Um, the first is I undertake the training. This means like the, um, it's referring to the monastic trainings, the ethical trainings. Of course, we're not monastics, but we undertake this um this endeavor, these activities, these strong intentions, not just intentions, but actions. So I undertake the training to abstain from taking life. Um, obviously other people and also animals and insects and also Oh, I just got a pop up that my internet connection is unstable. So uh, you can let me know in the chat if it's freezing or anything. Um,
thing from taking life is uh, the first one. And the second is I undertake the training to abstain from taking what isn't freely given. So awkwardly worded, it means not, not stealing, not taking what isn't freely given to us. This, this could be, you know, just on the surface, obviously not stealing, um, but also are we taking time? Are we taking energy? Are we taking um, resources from the earth more than we need, etc.? There's lots we can reflect on there. The third is I undertake the training to abstain from sensuous misconduct. So this can be with our sexuality and with our sensuality, causing harm to others and to ourselves through sexuality and sensuality. The fourth is I undertake the training to refrain from false speech. Sometimes a harmful speech is also included, um, but it means not lying, not gossiping, not uh, I undertake the training to abstain from intoxicants that cloud the mind. This obviously first comes to mind is drugs and alcohol to the extent that it, it clouds the mind and causes heedlessness. So when we're intoxicated, we are less heedful, less mindful, less aware, less clear, and we cause harm with our speech, our actions to ourselves and to others. Um, it, this can also include the intoxicants of the internet, of our phone addictions, of our you know, shopping addictions, all of the things we get intoxicated by to the extent that they cloud the mind and cause us to be heedless, uh, not mindful. So these, uh, to me, stand out as things that are worth doing no matter how it turns out because they create a calm, in my own heart and mind, in our own hearts and minds, and they create safety for each other in community. It's interesting, there, there are some suttas or uh, uh, teachings in the Dharma on hope. Um, it's not, it, and, and, and it is also hmm, woven into the Four Noble Truths, which is like ground zero of the Dharma. The Four Noble Truths have within them hope is, is totally the thread through there. So the first Noble Truth is that part of this life experience includes suffering. Suffering in losing what we want to keep and not being able to get rid of what we don't want in short, <laughs> very short. And the second noble truth is that there can be an, an ending of that suffering. Um, no, the second is that there's a cause of suffering. Okay. I apologize. The first is that part of the life experience is that we experience suffering. Even the joys are not permanent, and so they can it can be painful. And the second is that there is a cause of that suffering. The cause is clinging. And the third is that there can be an ending of suffering. So this is the element of hope that it's absolutely possible in this human life, in this day, in this moment, that when the, if we uh, really can understand the cause clinging 
and then cease clinging, suffering will not be arising. And then there's the whole path is the fourth noble truth, the path to the way, the middle path, the eightfold path towards cultivating the ending of suffering. So I, I really hear hope woven right into the foundation of these teachings as a gift that we don't have to surrender, as a power that we don't have to throw away. Hmm. And uh, in this uh, article, Rebecca says this. She, I, 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 I love this reframing. She says, my own inquiry into the grounds for hope has received two great reinforcements in recent years. One came from the recognition of how powerful are the altruistic, idealistic forces already at work in the world. And she says this, most of us would say, if asked, that we live in a capitalist society. Depends on where you're watching from and where you're living, but uh, many of us are living in a capitalist society. And then she says, but vast amounts of how we live our everyday lives, our interactions with and commitment to family lives, to friendships, to our avocations, our memberships in social, spiritual, and political organizations are all in essence non-capitalist or even anti-capitalist, made up of things we do for free, out of love and on principle. That was really lovely to hear when I read it. Feeling so overwhelmed and trapped by this system and oppressed by it and seeing oppressions by it and to hear this reframing that in essence our relationships our ethics our uh, contributions to our communities are in essence non-capitalist or even anti-capitalist certainly for me the dharma is as well all the teachings I've received over so many years have been given freely and um, and we have the opportunity to support the continuation of those and to support our teachers. Um, but that can, is uh, certainly a model of, um, of hope and uh, as Rebecca calls it, Okay, um, just a few more notes of inspiration here. Uh, this one is from a, a Buddhist nun, Aya Yeshi. She's an Australian Buddhist nun. Um, and she sees hope as resilience. It's our long-term commitment to practice, to the practice and to social justice to compassion and equanimity, and also to watering the seeds of joy and happiness within ourselves. That's how she uh, has referred to hope. That long-term commitment that, again, something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. That commitment to our practice, to social justice, to compassion, uh, responding. Compassion is an action, a response to the suffering of others. Commitment to equanimity and watering the seeds of joy and happiness in ourselves and of course in others. So important and so easily overlooked. Um and this is the last one I'll share. 
really probably my favorite quote on uh, hope from uh, author Barbara Kingsolver in her book called Animal Dreams. I love this because it's so visceral for me. I'm kind of a visual learner, so I can really picture this and feel this description. See how it lands for you. The very least you can do in your life, the very least you can do in your life is to figure out what you hope for. Again, wise hope, not deluded hope. And the most you can do is live inside that hope. Not admire it from a distance, but live right in it under its roof. What I want is so simple, I almost can't say it. Elemental kindness. Enough to eat. Enough to go around. The possibility that kids might one day grow up to be neither the destroyers nor the destroyed. That's running down its hallway and touching the walls on both sides. Can you imagine if hope really lived that close for us? Sometimes I, I literally do this when I'm walking down a hall and put my hands out and touch both sides of the hall. Depends on the width of the hall. But it is, and then imagine if hope, I'm living in hope in that way. Running down its hallway and touching the walls on both sides. Under its roof, living right in it. So uh, in our practice tonight, we'll be including some self-reflection on how hope is for you. um, And what your relationship is with it not in any self-judgmental way of course but curiosity do i actually feel pretty disconnected from hope um and this is a practice that we can cultivate yes i think that's it Hmm. okay so um get what you need to be comfortable for a practice to um orient the heart and to cultivate this within ourselves for each other for ourselves you can dim your lights or uh, i'm just gonna have some water who hmm and um It, it arose for me some years ago, a kind of acronym around hope. Uh, acronyms are all the rage these days. <laughs> so obviously it's the letters H-O-P-E, hope. And the first letter means uh, being here, present. And then the O is open, open to how things are. P is the potential to, to understand that everything is impermanent of the nature to arise and change and that we have an effect in the world. And E is engaged, recalling what gives us hope and offering that to the world. So this will be the practice that we'll be um, working with tonight. Hmm. So settling into your posture that feels supportive. That feels kind to your body. But also this is, uh, these are practices of awakening. So helpful to have a posture that uh, supports wakefulness. Setting aside other distractions as much as possible.
and then resting your eyes either closed or downward. And as we settle into our posture, let's take some time to either inwardly just listen to these ethics that I mentioned, our values, or uh, reflecting on them, silently repeating them, or just uh, feeling into your own values that uh, feel like something worth doing no matter how it turns out. I undertake the training to abstain from taking life. I undertake the training to abstain from taking what isn't freely given. I undertake the training to abstain from sensuous misconduct. I undertake the training to abstain from false or harmful speech. And I undertake the training to abstain from intoxicants that cause heedlessness. And in the next few moments of silence, you can feel into how these ethics or your own values support you, offer protection and peace of mind, and they support and protect others. What does that feel like in the body, in the mind and in the heart? Feeling the support of these ethics. In the same way that we feel the support of the ground here and now. Feel that you're being held. And rest into support of the ground and the support of your skillful intentions. See if you can soften any tension that's holding you away from that support. Relaxing the face, dropping the shoulders, softening the belly, relaxing the hands.
And the first aspect of this wise hope, as we're practicing it here tonight, is with the H of being here, embodied. Opening to the sensations of temperature, pressure, texture. Tingling of pulse. Vibration. Body is always here and now in this center moment. For these next few minutes of silence, just resting with being here, the first letter of this HOPE acronym, here. If there's a lot of sounds in your environment, that can be part of your anchor of being here. And the second part of the practice of hope here, and then the O is open. Opening to how things are. The 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows. Opening to how things are right now in your heart, your mind, your body our world. You don't need to do a lot of thinking here or looking. Just see what naturally arises as you open to how things are. And as we're here, open to gently knowing and receiving how things are, we move to P, potential, to 
deeply know and understand that everything is of the nature to arise and pass, The change is the only constant. What does that potential feel like in your heart, mind, body? Right now, living in that hope, running down its hallway, touching the walls on both sides. The knowing that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. Here, open, touching into feeling potential. Which is related to Feeling the potential to offer our ethics, our wisdom, our compassion to that world. You might include here some reflection or just see what naturally arises to recall what it is that gives you hope. Because this brings us the aspiration, the inspiration to act, to engage. So what gives you hope? Nature's ability to rejuvenate when the humans stop harming? Is it being with children? Is it some relationships you've had that have been healing, compassionate? What gives you hope? Maybe it's some of the bigger social, cultural movements of change. Maybe it's the Four Noble Truths.
perhaps you feel hope from Rosemary's reflection of how our relationships can be non-capitalist, freely giving, And then lastly, see how it feels in your body, heart, mind, your own personal relationship to hope at this time. Why is hope? Does it feel far away? Does it feel energizing? Does it feel possible for yourself, for each other? for the world. If hope was a sensation in your body, what does it feel like? Where is it? This poem is called Hope by Rosemary Watola Tromer. Hope has holes in its pockets so that we, when anxious, can follow it. Hope's secret is it doesn't know the destination. It knows only that all roads begin with one foot in front of the other. Thank you for being here and sharing this cultivation of wise hope. I, I hope it is helpful for you and uh, inspiring. And if when you checked into your relationship with hope at this time, if it feels like um, more pessimism than wise hope, it's a practice, it's a bhavana that we cultivate so give it some attention um, and uh, that piece from uh, was it Ayeshi? Yeah um, and how watering the seeds of joy and happiness in ourselves is part of cultivating hope 
so um, obviously also engaging in the world um, hope is related to compassion which is an action a response so if you're feeling really burned out and uh, a lack of hope just see is there something out of balance and uh, maybe revisit this practice in your own way or in a way that resonates for you being here being open feeling your potential and engaging in it and uh, I'll be away uh, with the water and the trees camping next uh, week, so I won't be here, but we'll be back um, the last week in um, August. Oh, last week. A version. Okay. <laughs> so thanks for being here, and check the links down below in the YouTube recording.